Okay, so tonight, um, now that we have sort of gotten bibliology out of the way, and we, we understand that the bibli- that bibliology, in, in, in one sense, is the, <clears throat> um, is the foundation, uh, not the foundation for theology, but the, for the, but the foundation for studying theology, so that we know where it is that we are getting our information. And as we, as we sort of progress through, and you're going to see it tonight, that there's going to be some slides up here with a whole mess of verses. Uh, and, and I decided early on when I was putting this class together that there's just no, if I, if I have to hit every verse, then this, this class is going to go on for a year. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to hit a few selected verses here in the class a lot more are going to be on the screen, and there's even more than that that, um, that, that support what we're talking about. So, um, again, a reminder that if you feel like, oh, he went past the verses, I didn't get to write them all down, you can go online when I send the link out to all, everybody's email, click on that link, and that will take you to a place where you can watch the video and you can look at all the documents that we have, like tonight, the, the one I gave out tonight, the Trinity, that one's going to be on there. The one, the two that I gave out last week, that's on there now. And you can click on that and open it up, and you can print it off, and you can have, and, and uh, plus all the slides are going to be on there, again, as a PDF, so you'll be able to bring them up and print them. You know, if you want, you can, you know, some people take a picture of it, whatever, you know, but don't panic if... I switched the thing and you didn't get a chance to get all the verses. There's ample opportunity for you to get it uh, later. Um, but what we are studying tonight is, is the, what's called theology proper, which is the actual study of God himself. You know, we're going to be, if you look in your, in your schedule, we'll be studying a lot of things about God and a lot of things about our faith um, but this is this is just studying uh, God Himself, um, and the first question we ask ourselves is why? Why? Why do we need to study God Himself? First uh, Peter three fifteen says, "But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear." So, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Let's start with sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Okay, sanctify means to make special, to set aside. <clears throat> Excuse me. To have a special place for it, so that God is not in there with your things to do today. You know, God, your your understanding and your knowledge of God is not in the same category as your you know, understanding of computers or how to cook or, you know, the, the things that we do in our life, that, that God, understanding God has to have a special place in our heart, sanctify, set aside, make a special place for God in our heart. Why? So that we can give an answer to those that ask. So that when somebody says, oh, what, you know, when, people find out that you're a believer and they start asking you questions about your faith and they start asking you questions about God, you can give them an answer. Uh, and, um, and the word defense in there is the word apologia in the, in the Greek, which is we get our word apology you know, for us now in these days, the word apology means saying I'm sorry. Well, originally the word apology in English meant to give an explanation. It was, was it Socrates or Aristotle, the famous apology. It was the defense of everything he believed in. And, <clears throat> um, and that's what apology, apologia means to logic out. And, and this, is, this is what as believers, God expects us to do. When people say, you know, well, why doesn't God just forgive everybody? And why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Well, 
you want to be able to give an answer for that. You know, and we're even going to talk about that famous question that people ask, can God make a rock so big that he himself can't lift it? We're going to talk about that tonight. You know, when people ask you a question like that, you want to be able to <clears throat> give an answer, give a response. That's why it's important to, to study God. And also because what we believe about God, and your book says this, and I really enjoy that quote, what we believe about God is the most important thing about us. It determines our actions um, and our view of the world and how we treat each other. And, and just all the decisions that we make. You know, when, what, <clears throat> if I don't know much about God and I don't believe much about God and I don't hold much of it in my, you know, of who he is in my heart, then it doesn't affect me a whole lot. But the more I know about him, the more it affects my life and the way that I view things and the way that I... I um, hold opinions. You know, I've had people, you know, why is it Christians? They all believe this. They all believe that. Well, because it's, yeah, because it's true. And it's because it's what God has told us is true. And there's a consistency in it because it all, it all comes from the same book. You know, so... Um, what we believe about God affects the way that we um, conduct our lives. Uh, and it's also important that as we study God, we're not, we're not making an attempt to create a God or to invent or design our own God. Okay, we, we, um, we study God to discover who he is, to discover the God who was there. In Hebrews 4.13 it says, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we, to whom we must give an account. And I, I, I like the way that the King James says this. The King James says, to him with whom we have to do. He's the God we have to deal with. You know, and it can be, and who he is can be inconvenient for us. And this is where the world differs. The world wants to, as, as um, the word describes in, uh, in Isaiah, the guy that sits there and cooks his food on, on a campfire. And then he pulls out, once the campfire's over and he's eaten and he's done, and he pulls out one of the logs from the campfire and he carves it. And then he sticks it on the ground and then he bows down and worships it. Right? This is what the world does. I think I know how God should be. My God would never do that. You know, a God that I would believe in would, you know, wouldn't do something or would be this way. And that's like marrying somebody you don't know and expecting, to be, expecting them to be exactly the way you want them to be. They are who they are. You know, you can't just decide how somebody is going to be. You can't meet a new person, come to church. I just met this person. I want them to be very talkative and friendly. And well, in reality, they're shy. They're not, they're not that talkative. They're a little more reserved. Well, I want them to be this way. Well, you, you deal with whom you have to do. And, and the, the God that we have is the God with whom we have to do. And we, if we want to go and invent our own God, then we're like the guy at the campfire. And, he's, and it's not God. And when people do that, they find that the God that they create is remarkably similar to themselves. You know, and if, if you, and this is an interesting quote that I've heard Bill say, if, if you don't at some point in your walk, um, how do you put it? If there isn't something that you read about God that initially you don't like, that you disagree with, then there's actually something wrong. Now, the question is, what do you do with it when you disagree with it? You read something, you say, I don't like that. Well, you have to say, well, I may not like it, but it's true, and it's who God is, so I have to accept it. You know? Um, <clears throat> and I don't mean, like, just completely disagreeing with God, but, you know, have you ever met somebody that you absolutely agreed 100% with? No, and God's the same. There, there were things about God that, that 
our personal, our flesh in particular, because God wants to burn away our flesh. That's usually the area that we most disagree with God most often, is areas that cause me to get rid of my flesh. And those points where we find things out about God that we disagree with are the points where we grow, where we have to determine, okay, am I going to make God okay with this? Or am I going to make me okay with God? Right? So that's, you know, that's the process that we do here is not to determine how God should be, but to determine how he has described himself. You know, we don't get to choose what God is like. The, you know, the, the, the name Yahweh or Y-H-W-H that was given to Moses it is the existent one is really what it, what it best translates to, the name that is given to God. The one that is, period. He is. He's the God that is. And even, you know, as he, as he said to Moses, I am who I am. Who, who shall I say sent me? Sent, yeah, who sh- whom shall I say sent me? He says, I am that I am. Tell them that I am sent you, the one who is sent you. <clears throat> and, and ultimately, what I think about God is, is irrelevant. So, we start off in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, verse I'm sure we're all aware of, you know, when we come to, anyone who comes to God must first believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Right? So, the first thing we do, the first step is believing that he is. And this is what's called ontology, which is just a fancy word for, for being. You know, like we said, the, 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 he, the, um, the one who is. Um, and that he is a reward. And these are the two things we're going to look at. We're going to look at who he is, and then we're going to look at his attributes, he is a rewarder. So, you know, God is, God is great. He is. He is God. But he's also good. You know, it's, it's, it's who, there is who God is, and there is what he's like. And the, what God is like, there's a term that we use. And, you know, I don't want to get super technical. I only put some of these words up, and I'm going to put some other, I'm going to put some other words when we get to really talking about this <clears throat> later. I don't put them up to show off. I don't put them up to confuse you or to get super technical. But the most important thing about this principle is when we talk about the attributes of God, we talked a little bit about it last week, it's called the divine predicate, which means... You know, the predicate is, is, is um, it's like in a sentence, right? It's, you're saying something about something. The predicate is the, is the, the body of a sentence. It's the, the part with the verb in it, you know, where you're saying something about something. <clears throat> and so the divine predicate is, is, is like the same thing. It's what we say about God. And it's very important that as we go through God's attributes, that we understand that this is what we say about him. This is what is revealed about him in his word, but it's still what we say about him. The, the level of, of that attribute is beyond what we can comprehend. Okay? So when I say that God is just, I say it because it's a word we can understand. But God's justice is very different from our justice. You know, our justice is, is, um, is limited. Our justice is not perfect. And we, you know, even, even the best judges sometimes find cases that they wrestle with and they go, you know, there's just no, there's no right answer to this one. And they do their best to, to mete out the best justice they can find. But God's justice is so far beyond that. Um... And it's like God's love, you know. Uh, it 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 almost denigrates the word love 
to use the same word that we use for love, for God. So, you know, we have, but we have to talk about it. We have to use words and we have to, we have to have, you know, what's called an analogy. We have to have something that we can compare it to so we can understand what we're talking about. <clears throat> so, so this is why we say, this is what we say about him. This is what we are calling him. <clears throat> so, so the first hurdle, obviously, we have to get through is that God is. And again, we talked a little bit about this last week, right? Um, Psalm 19, 1 to 6. You can turn there in your Bible if you like. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and the words of the end of the world. In them he has set the tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven. <clears throat> and then in Romans 1. Starting in verse 19. Verses 19 and 20. Romans chapter 1. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world. His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Creation for us is proof, if you will, of the existence of God. We look around, and like we said last week, we see order. We see that things work in a certain way, and, um, and it's consistent. You know, we know that, for example, growing up in New England, you know that every fall, the leaves turn color. And then it seems like on one day in October, every leaf in the world hits the ground. <laughs> right? And, and it, ha it happens every, every year, like clockwork. There's an order, there's a system that we see, and it implies design. You know, there's order in creation. There's order in science. As much as science likes to pretend like they, like they don't believe in God, they depend on that order. Science couldn't exist. They couldn't predict things. They couldn't create a vaccine. They couldn't study a virus. They couldn't, you know, cure diseases or treat illnesses. They couldn't put a, you know, a rocket ship in space unless there were certain principles of science that they could rely upon. They know that if they do this thing, this is going to be the reaction because there's order in the universe. You know, we think about how they, how they did it back in the 60s, how they put a man on the moon with technology probably one-tenth of what I'm holding in my hand, you know, because of math. They saw, you know, if, you, if you've probably seeing Apollo 13 and they're up there and they're giving them stuff and they're like, and they're just writing things down. They got their slide rules and they're, you know, they're just working out the math and they know by doing this, they know how much thrust to give it to get to certain, this certain angle and above. How do they know that? How do they know it's going to work every time? Because there's order in the universe. Physics is an exact science. There's math involved and it, and it works every time. How, how do they know that certain medicines work? How do they know that biology works the way it works because it works that, that way every single time. How can they take a heart from somebody who's died and put it in somebody else and expect it to beat because there's something predictable about it? And order implies design. Design implies designer. 
It's not proof. We talked about that last week. I'm not going to find conclusive scientific proof of the existence of God, but we look for evidence for his existence. We talked also about cause and effect. There can't be what's called an infinite regress of causes. You can't just go on forever. There has to be, there has to be at one point an uncaused cause, a source, God. And that, that it must be an intelligent, because, an intelligent source because there has to be a will to say, okay, we're going to start the first thing. And, that is, and that's God. And the last thing we talk about, about the existence of God, evidence toward the existence of God, is the human conscience. This is what's often called the moral argument for the existence of God. Um, Romans 2, just, if you're still in there, you can just turn one page to Romans 2, in verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, allow, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Now, you know, we can, we can disagree, depending on our upbringing and whatnot, you know, we can disagree with some things that are right and some things that are wrong or some things that are acceptable and not acceptable. But the existence of right and wrong, just the existence that there are some things that are good, some things that are bad, there are some things that are right, and there are some things that are wrong, just the existence of the understanding of that where does that come from? Because, it's, because it is something outside of ourselves somehow. And our conscience is a real bizarre phenomenon. Because our conscience, when we're about to do something, something tells us, don't do it. There's something inside of us that's bugging us that we shouldn't do it. So, I mean, does that make us multiple personality? I mean, how, does that, how is it that I'm arguing with myself? How is it that I could be doing something that I don't want me to do? Because there's something in me that is outside of me, or at least has its source outside of me. And this is, this is somebody who's not even saved, has their conscience. There's something, and they, you, they, they can't explain it. You know, you can, you can eventually, over the course of time, you can sear it away, as we just heard in 1 Timothy, you know, you can sear your conscience, cauterize it so that it doesn't <clears throat> respond anymore. But that's not the natural state. And even when, when somebody is discovered that has no conscience, as has been diagnosed, they call them sociopaths. They, they don't understand the concept of right and wrong. It is, it's a mental disease. It's a psychological disorder. It's not normal, and that's, and that's by secular psychology, would call it not normal. It's a disorder, um, because there is something in us that tells us when something's wrong, even when we want to do it. Our brain is telling us to do it, and there's something else that says, you know, no, and it's something that is outside of us. Mm-hmm, sure. Sure. Well, ultimately, as we get, well, you know, once we're saved, <clears throat> it, is, it is through the conscience that the Holy Spirit speaks. It is, it is that connection with our spirit that, that is connected to our conscience, I think, that the Holy Spirit, now, when we are sensing conviction, and it's sort of in that same place that our conscience is, that's telling me right and wrong, <clears throat> only perhaps it's a little stronger and it's based on something that that God has given us but I think the conscience is, is was there it is to me it is that residue of God that is in every person and when our when our spirit is revived when we are born again then it is an instrument that God uses to communicate with us so it's yeah I think it's definitely connected 
So, and there's an interesting phenomenon that I read about one time, you know, regarding morality, that there is no, there is no society known to anthropology that has ever extolled um, selfishness as a virtue. Selflessness is always a virtue in every society. Selfless, selfishness is always a vice. Why? Why is there not one society that, that, that builds a statue and they say, now that was a selfish man. Now, we may reward, especially in America, we reward selfishness, you know, uh, just it's the nature of capitalism. <laughs> um, and, and perhaps that's why capitalism works, is because we're by nature we're selfish. <clears throat> um, but it's never, nobody ever says, I want to be as selfish as possible. It's just never, it's in no society is it ever a virtue. And why is that? It's, 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 a, it's an absolute, and it's without explanation because it is something that is outside of ourselves, you know? And another thing that's interesting is that, you know, how we, how we treat others, each of us may be different. We all may treat others differently than one another, but how we want to be treated is always the same. From society to society, how I want to be treated is the same as the way you want to be treated. And it's the same as you want to be treated and you. How I treat others may be different, but how I want to be treated is the same as everybody else. So it's, um, there is a consistency and there is an absolute that seems to go beyond um, ourselves. You know, where does this come from? It comes from God. You know, there is a God, you know, and this was, this was a point and, you know, I don't, I'm not going to be teaching a lot from Rene Descartes, but, you know, his point of, I think, therefore I am, you know, ca- actually came from the idea that, you know, well, what, what he, the conclusion he came to after that, after he said, well, I, I don't know if I exist. Well, the fact that I'm not sure if I exist proves that I exist, and then the, the, what, he, what people don't usually know is that after that, he said, now, if I exist, I know I didn't create myself. So, I mean, I don't know if anybody else exists, but I know I exist because I'm thinking about it. But I know that if I exist, I didn't create myself, so there must be one who created me, you know? And therefore, you know, we, we get to that place through just logic and through thinking and through some of these you know, um, apologetic arguments that, that, you know, you can, you can look up, you know, uh, about the creation of things in the existence. Why is there something rather than nothing? It's another question. Why isn't there just nothing? <laughs> something exists, and it had to come from somewhere, you know? So we can come to, the, to a logical conclusion based on the evidence that there is a God. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, okay, what is he like? And, and, and again, we, don't, we can't just decide what he is like. We have to discover what he is like. You know, it's like truth. Even in today's society, when people want to, want to invent truth, the reality is something is true. Whether we believe it or not, it's true. Truth is not invented. Truth is discovered. And, and God is truth. So, <clears throat> so we have this. Now we get to the, to the part about his attributes. Okay, the divine predicate. Okay, so just bear with me with a couple of terms. Okay, there is what's called univocal. Okay, which means it's the same. Okay, there is something that is called equivocal, and we've probably heard that. Don't equivocate. And that means that things are completely different. Now, there are some, there are some religions out there 
that say that you cannot know God. He is so wholly other. He is so different that he is unknowable. Right? That's the equivocal argument. He is so different. He is so something else that we can't even know anything about him. God is entirely unknowable. The interesting thing is, if that were true, then you wouldn't know that about him. Right? Um, the Islam is very much like this. I mean, they have certain things that they know that are written in the Quran, but generally speaking, God is unknowable. You know, you can't, you can't know his attributes. Uh, then there are, there are other uh, belief systems like pantheism, where God is what's called univocal. Which means he is exactly like us. Because we are him. He is in everything and everything is him. And we are exactly like him and he is exactly like us. Okay? Well, we're gonna, what we're going to do here today is land somewhere square in the middle, which is called analogous or analogy. Okay? God is not exactly like us, but he is not so different that we can't know him. There are some analogies that we can draw from what we read in the scriptures about what God is like and what some of his attributes are like. Okay? So, we have two categories of attributes. Natural and moral. Okay, now when I say natural, I don't mean as opposed to supernatural, because God is supernatural. By natural, I mean these are, these are attributes that pertain to his nature. These are, na- these are attributes that pertain to his morality, his, his character. You know, this has more to do with his being. And so we're going to start with the, what, what we're calling the, his natural attributes. Okay, and we'll, I think I've, I think I'm just going to get them all up here so we can, you can just see them all. So we start with transcendent, okay. <clears throat> Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. Come on. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite one. Uh, God is holy. He is separate. He is set apart. And we're going to talk about his holiness later. But this has to do with the fact that God is, is not one with his creation. He is something other. And we're going to talk about his imminence in a minute when, which is, which is, which speaks of his, of his oneness with nature, of his nearness with nature, but he is also transcendent. He is not indistinguishable from creation. He exists outside of it. Um, and because, because of that, he is not subject to the, to the laws of creation because he made them. He created the laws, but he's not subject to them. That's why, you know, supernatural things can happen. We see miracles and things like that. Um, but God is not um, indistinguishable from me or you or trees or plants and animals. He is set apart and distinct and different. And then his eminence is just the opposite of that, which is, means his nearness. In Psalm 34... Verse 18. Uh, 
The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. And then Paul says this in Acts 17. He's uh, talking to the, uh, the philosophers at the Areopagus the, on Mars Hill uh, in, verses 20, in verses 27 and 28. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as, as also some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. You know, he is, he is separate, but he is also in our midst. He's involved with his creation. Now, the deists emphasize his transcendence. They say God is like a clockmaker. He made the clock, he wound it up, set it down. Hey, whatever happens after this, I'm not really involved. You know, I'm out there, I'm transcendent, I'm not involved, I don't stick my hand in the, in the works, I don't, I don't operate on the earth anymore, I don't get involved, and that's why the, you know, the deists typically, they don't believe in miracles, they don't believe in healings, they don't, you know, anything like that. Um, they just think, yeah, there's a God out there somewhere, he's out there, you know, but he can't be bothered with us and he's got his own thing going on. You know, the pantheists, like um, Hindus, um, they believe in the total imminence of God. God is one. God is not indistinguishable. You know, Brahman is all. And God is, God is, is the, the universe is God, and God is the universe. And, you know, I, we're all one with it, and God sort of permeates everything, and he is part of everything. You know, and, and again, the balance is that he is a distinct personality and, and separate from his creation, but he is also near to us. Okay, number three is omnipotent, all-powerful, right? Uh, Romans 1, it talks about his eternal power and glory. Uh, Jeremiah thirty two seventeen says, nothing is too hard for you. And Luke 1, 37, nothing is impossible for God, for with God all things are possible, right? God can do anything. But now, this is where we get tricky. You know, with, with omnipotence, there are intrinsic limitations that are self-imposed, okay? God cannot lie. Is it possible for God to lie? No, because the Bible says it is impossible for God to lie. Okay, but if nothing is impossible for, for him, then why is it impossible for him to lie? Because he cannot do what he cannot do. He cannot do something that is against his very nature. Because then, then he would cease to be God. You know, so there are, there are, in one sense, there are self-imposed limitations. Right? And omnipotence is, is said to refer to his possibilities, not his impossibilities. And this is where we get the we get the rock question. Can God make a rock so big that he himself can't lift it? Okay, the problem is it's a dumb question. And that's what you can, that's, that's what you can say somebody to say, to, you know, to, if somebody asks you that question. You say, and here's the response. Can you make a square circle? You know, if they want an answer to that question, say, I'll tell you what, I'll answer your question if you'll answer this. Can you make a square circle? Well, no, because a square is not a circle, and a circle is not a square. So you can't make a square a circle, because then it would be a circle, not a square. Exactly. You're asking me, can God do something that he cannot do? Well, he can't do something that he cannot do, but, you know, the, there's a problem in the logic of the, of the question. that You're asking him to do something that is impossible for him to do. So... The problem is not in the answer. The problem is in the question. Now, God is also omnipresent. And what does that mean? Jeremiah 23, 24. Twenty 
3.24, can anyone hide himself in the secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? 1 Kings 8.27, what does Solomon say? He says, the heavens and the heavens' heavens cannot contain you. You know, Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? Right? He, he is everywhere. He is, and he is fully present. Okay? And he's not spread thin. He's not like a, like a mist, you know, that, you know, well, he's thinner over here, and the more he goes, the thinner he gets. God is fully present in every place. And the center, here's, here's an interesting way to put it. The center of God, the very center of God is everywhere. You know, it's not like a part of him is here and another part of him is there. <clears throat> One way to look at it is this. Because we have, we sort of get this idea in our head because we're just, we're limited that God exists within the universe. The universe exists within God. So he, that's why he is everywhere. Because he, he is existence. Everything that exists, exists in him. So he is not just sort of, he's here and he's there and he can be, you know, he can move so fast and it's like he's everywhere. Everything exists within him. So that's why he is everywhere. Um, omniscient. Okay, God knows everything. Psalm 147. Verse 5. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Matthew 10.36. Got that one wrong. Is it 34? Oh, verse 30? Oh, yes, that's it. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I don't know why I put there. Change that right now. You know, and again, in, in Psalm 139, you know where I sit, you know where I lie down. You know, he knows all events, he knows all thoughts. You know, it's not, it's not that he can read our mind. I mean, he can. It's just he knows the thoughts. He just, he already knows them. And he knows all truths. He knows all possibilities because he's already seen them. And I love something that Kent Hovind said. He says, it, it's occurred to me that nothing has ever occurred to God. <laughs> nothing, nothing surprises him. God never says, oh, I hadn't seen it. I, you know, I, I, I never thought of it that way before. You know, he's fully aware of, of everything at all times. And it's, it's often described um, as, uh, Chuck Smith has often described it, as being on the 20th floor of a building and watching a parade. You see the whole thing from beginning to end. You know, when you're down the street, you sort of see each little piece as it goes by. And you, you gain knowledge and you become aware of each piece as it goes by. And you don't know what's coming down there. But when you're up there, you see the beginning and the end. You see the whole thing as one thing. And that's how God sees everything in full knowledge. Okay, God is eternal. And these next two sound like they're the same, eternal and infinite, but they're not. Eternal means timeless, you know, and we, we read in Isaiah 57 about um, he, he, is, he, in, he inhabits eternity. Again, a concept that we, that we can't even understand, you know, what, what eternity is. But again, that parade paints another picture of it. 
that he, God does not exist in time. And this was, we were having a discussion with somebody on Sunday. Um, and I, so I, this is just my personal postulation. Because sometimes we think of, you know, all the saints that have gone on before us, because this was the question, all the saints that have gone on before us, what are they doing in heaven right now with the Lord? And I threw this out. Really, it's a postulation of mine, and I throw it out there just because just it makes my brain go, oh, wow, that's, that would be different. That if time doesn't exist in God's presence, then when, when we either get raptured or pass on, and we get up there and we see like David, it's David. Wow, you've been here all this time. He says, I just got here. Everybody, we're all here. We all just got here. Throughout all the centuries of all those ones that are going to be in heaven, will we get there and they're all going to say, no, we just got here. We all just, because there, there is no time. And you just got here. For you, it was like forever. But for us, I don't know. They're not aware of the passage of time here on earth. You know, and, and think of that's God's existence. He is the eternal is. There's no was, there's no gonna be. He is eternal, and he's all, he always has been. He is, he is the way things are, because people say, well, where did God come from? God, God didn't come from anywhere. He is the way things are. He is. You know, again, we think, well, where did God come from? Well, you're thinking in that there is something that God has to appear into, like the universe. God doesn't have to appear into anything. He, he is the way things are. We appeared into him. There cannot be a before God because it assumes time, and God invented time. So there is no before God. So God always is. Now, the fact that he's infinite means unlimited, and it really refers to, you know, all of his attributes as well, and we can turn to, man, um, to uh, Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Lord, uh, starting in verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you f- had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You know, he's not conv- confined to the universe that he created. You know, and he has chosen to limit himself at times, you know, appearing as an angel or a man, Philippians 2, becoming incarnate, becoming a man, and living, putting him, placing himself into time, which is an interesting concept, that eternity stepped into time in the person of Jesus Christ. But he is infinite in that there are no limits except the limits that he imposes upon himself. He is unchangeable. Hebrew chapter 1. Verse 12, like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. You know, James 1.17 talks about there is, in him there is no variation or shadow of turning. You know, God, God doesn't change. There's no need for him to change. He's perfect. So he, he is the way he has always been. And he doesn't, he doesn't look upon himself and say, well... Maybe I was wrong, and I need to change. Uh, and, you know, even when we see scriptures where it says, well, God changed his mind or God repented, it's not that God changed his mind. It's, you know, um, and it's always because man has changed, and so God's response is different than what he would have wanted it to be. You know, but God knew that that was the way it was going to go anyway. So it wasn't even really a change. 
So there's no need for God to change. And lastly, of his, of his natural attributes, is he is personal. Okay, he is a, um, let me turn to Exodus 3.14. Again, this is God speaking to Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What does that mean? He's, he's, he has a self-awareness. He's not, there's, there's not, he's not, you know, an impersonal force. Sort of the way the Jehovah Witnesses see the Holy Spirit. They don't see the Holy Spirit as a person. They see him as, as a, like, almost like electricity. He's a force in the universe. And, and there are some who see God that way. He, she, it, whatever. You know, Star Wars, right? The force be with you. That the force is an energy that permeates the universe. And, and you just have to get in touch with that with that force. No, God is not just this impersonal force that we tap into. He is someone. And he is a person. <clears throat> and being a person, since, since he has made us a person, and it's interesting that we would think, that people would think that we are higher than God in that sense, that we are individuals and we are persons with individualness and personness and and um, personality but that God is not why would God be any less than we are and because God made us that way the same as him then we can know him that's how we know we can know God is because he is a person and he has attributes he has things that he you know he has likes and dislikes we read throughout the scripture what does God want? God's will. If God has a will, then he has a mind, and he has a mind of his own, and he's a person. And then we can know him. So the next is what we call the moral attributes. Okay? And the thing that's important about this is that, look, God can have all the natural attributes that we just talked about and have the ethics of Adolf Hitler, right? There's nothing, there's nothing in those attributes that, that make him love people, you know, that makes him care, that makes him just, that makes him, you know, that these are all, these are just... Um, attributes or descriptions of of his being and the way he is but these have to do with his morality if you can call it that again it's a it's a poor word to say that god is moral is 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 really denigrating to god to use a word like moral to god because god is morality right So the first one we look at is holiness. Very similar to transcendence, uh, but it is, it is the, the sum total of the perfection of God. It is moral excellence. It is about being separated and set apart, because, but it's because he is so much better than we are in every way. He is so far superior to us in his morality, in every, in every way, that he is, he is in this case, in this attribute, he is wholly other than us. That we can't even compare our level of morality and understanding of right and wrong to, uh, to God's level of morality and holiness. Um, Habakkuk, 113 says he is too pure to even look upon evil. He is free from all evil and hates and abhors sin. Leviticus 19.2. He cannot be unholy. 
it's not just a character trait, it's who he is. He has always been holy. Revelations 15, 4. He is the holy one. There is none as holy as he in 1 Samuel 2, 2. He is the cause of holiness in others. If it was not for his holiness, for his superiority, we would not know, we would not understand that right from wrong and purity. And even his creation, even nature is pure until we came along and messed it up. And then in 1 Peter, after all that, in 1 Peter 1, 6, he says, be holy as I am holy. The example that he gives for us. Understanding that, we, that he knows that we cannot attain that level of holiness, but that is the example we look to. That we don't use that as an excuse. Well, I can't be as perfect as God. I can't be as holy as God, so why even try? No, that is, that's, that's what we attain to. The purity and the rightness Proverbs 8, in verse 36. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. In Ezekiel 8, 184 it's like it's in you know in one way it's it's like saying he you know he can't help himself genesis genesis 3 don't eat of the fruit of good and evil the knowledge of good and evil the aid of it okay then we're dealing with it right now god didn't say well okay let me give you a second chance I'm holy. I can't tolerate that. He, there's, there's no tolerance to unholiness in the presence of God. Ezekiel 18.4. Behold, all souls are mine, and the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Very clear stuff. God doesn't tolerate unholiness and then God's love God's goodness directed toward us it it portrays him as our father right 1 John 4 8 God is love not that he has love he is love he is the very existence of love and his love is what motivates him it's why he does what he does. It's God's why. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? Why did he give his only begotten son? Because he loved the whole world. Because he loved us. Right? That's his motive. That's his reason for doing things. That's his motivation. And ultimately, his love is expressed on the cross. Romans 5, 8, and Ephesians 2, 4. And God's love is, is different from our love. Again, using our crass language in an attempt to, to describe it. But, you know, cause, because we think of love as an emotion. When love is not an emotion, love is, number, first and foremost, it's an action. Uh, even when it's a noun, it's still... The noun is the is the um, the existence of that action, uh, and the word that we get in the scripture for God's love is agape love, and it is <clears throat> a subjective love, which means see an object of love looks at somebody and says, "There's something about that person that I love." There's something about that person that I am attracted to, that, that gives me pleasure, you know, that's objective love. I'm, I'm attracted to the object. The love is dependent on the object, right? Because it, it has to do something about that person that draws me. And in the, in the New Testament, that word is phileo. And there's nothing wrong with it. We have it for one another. 
There were things about each other that, yeah, I really like that guy. I like being around him or that lady or whatever it is. Something that is attractive to that other, you know, to me about that other person that draws me to them. Well, there's nothing about me that is attractive to God. There's nothing about me that God looks down and says, you know, I just, I just love that guy. <laughs> Something about him, no, that's, that's, it's subjective love. He is the subject, right? Think about our old English grammar. He's the subject of the, sen- of the sentence. I love you. It's all I and no you. It's I, why do you love them? Because I'm God and I choose to love them. And that's it. There's nothing in them that I find lovely. There's nothing in them that has motivated me to love them. The only motive I have for loving them is because I am love. And thank God, literally, that God's love for me does not depend on me. It does not depend on me doing anything, but it is his choice to love me. You know, and it may not sound all sort of fluffy and fuzzy like phileo love does, you know, sort of warm and, you know, there's something nice and, and compatible about it. The, the agape love is, I love you no matter what. It's not about you. Don't take it personally, but it's not about you. And thank God, because we would never receive his love if it was. And that's what makes it unconditional. Because there was nothing about you that made me start to love you, so why would I use you as an excuse to not love you anymore? Because you were never the reason for my loving you to begin with. So that makes it a stronger love. Because it's based in the subject, God. So, you know, that's why when we talk about love, you know, and compare it, you know, what we call love to God's love, it's, it's, not, even, it's not even comparable. Then we have God's justice, right? Deuteronomy 32.4. And this to me is, is really one of God's most impactful attributes. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of truth without injustice. Righteousness, righteous and upright is he. I think on, I think it was Wednesday night, we were talking about this, about righteousness. And righteousness and justice are pretty much saying the same thing. Um, it's that dot, if you were here Wednesday night. The, the, the word um, for righteousness in the New Testament, there's an implication, a picture of a dot, a circle, with a dot in the middle of it. A tiny, tiny dot in the middle of it. Everything that is on that dot is righteous. Anything not on the dot is unrighteousness. You know, it's, it's, it's not, there are no gray areas. It's not, well, I'm close to righteousness. This is not horseshoes and hand grenades. You know, it doesn't matter if we're close. You need to be on it. You need to be planted square on that dot in order to be called righteous or just. Interesting picture, because when we get into man and sin, the word for sin, hamartia, means to miss the mark. It's an interesting picture, isn't it? But that he is on that dot, and anything that is not on that dot is not righteous. God does right and acts rightly all the time. He is an impartial judge. He's not swayed by anything other than what is right and wrong. He's not rash or unprincipled. He's not affected by personal feelings. Right? He doesn't look at them and say, well, but they're my children. You know, he's going to reign on the just and the unjust. And he cannot ignore his justice. This This is what is... To me, is so powerful that God, and we'll get into this more when we when we get into soteriology. But God cannot in, ignore His justice. This is the this is the the answer for that person that says, "Well, why can't God just forgive everybody?" 
because if you had a judge like that in, court, in a court of law, you'd call him a lousy judge. If you had a judge who just says, well, you know, everybody can go free. Everybody's found innocent. Everybody's not guilty. Everybody, the child molester, the murderer, everybody, you know, that's okay. Because I, I, you know, I'm a loving guy. So we're just going to let people go. People would look at that. They wouldn't say, oh, what a loving, wonderful judge. they say, what a rotten judge. So why would God be any different? God can't wink at sin. He can't just say, well, but I love them, so we'll let this one slide. God is just, and his, and his justice precedes his love. God says, I want to love them. I want to demonstrate my love for them, but I can't because my justice says I have to condemn them. Now, his love motivated him to say, okay, wait a minute. If we satisfy my justice, then my love can be poured out because my justice has been satisfied. But until my justice is satisfied, I can't do it. So that's what motivated him to pay the price for our sin was his love, but his justice had to be satisfied in order for that to happen. So that's why, to me, his justice is is, um, so powerful. And there is a misconception that the Old Testament, well, that's a God of justice, and the New Testament is a God of love. Uh, it's not. It's not the case at all. It's, it, he is. He is who he is. He is unchangeable. He is the same God in the Old Testament as he was in the New Testament. And the New Testament, we just see the fulfillment of what he had already put in place. You know, the the works he had already gotten underway um, back in the Old Testament. His love was there. His provision was there. It just hadn't come to fruition until the New Testament. Dick, did you have a question or a comment? Absolutely. <laughs> but God reconciles it. What does it say that, um, but that um, mercy and truth have met together? Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. How? God, God has somehow found that, that reconciliation between righteousness and mercy. And, yeah, in, at the cross, yeah, but... You know, we're always, you know, in raising our own kids, we're always like, oh, you know, I want to I wanna be firm, but I don't, you know, but I want to love them. You know, I want to show mercy, but I also want to teach them a lesson. You know, we're always doing this thing. God has found that sweet spot through the cross um, that where righteousness and, and mercy have met together. So, and then we get to mercy, and this is the, the, the next, just like you were, you were talking about. He is filled, full of pity and mercy, long suffering. Suffering, Second Peter three nine, and mercy is is essentially not getting what we deserve. Okay, you know, um, grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. God holding back his judgment. You know, it is free, it is infinite, and it is eternal. Um, lastly, truth. God is truth. We, we talked about earlier, God does not lie. All his, 1 Corinthians one twenty. all his promises are yea and amen. Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. God can be trusted. He is truth. He's the existence of truth. He is the canon against every, what everything can be measured. You know, and that's why we rely on the scripture to, to live our lives and to base our decisions on is because it is reliable. It is his word and it's truth. Um. A couple of other attributes that we're going to get into later in the course. We've already talked about his grace. 
Uh, it really is going to come up more effectively when we talk about it in, in soteriology and then also his sovereignty, uh, which will come up again in, in um, soteriology. Uh, it's very important in that to sort of marry it to that. So we're going to put those two attributes until we, get to, until we get to that point. Now, lastly, we're going to talk about the Trinity. And we are not going to even try to make an attempt to explain it other than to just talk about it. It's difficult for us to fully understand. It involves things that our finite mind cannot grasp easily. Um, and some of it is that it's a semantic problem because we don't have the words in the English language in order to describe, you know, what the Trinity is. Um, the Trinity, the word Trinity does not appear in the scriptures, doesn't appear until I think Tertullian uh, wrote, uh, used that word. Um, it's not explained, but it is, it is assumed. And it was, a, it was a term that was used frequently in the church and really didn't even get addressed. They didn't even try to explain it because it was so understood. It was so matter of fact. It was so assumed that it wasn't until the fourth century that they even tried to defend it because there were some issues about um, the deity of Christ that they felt that they had to sort of explain, you know, what the Trinity was. Um, we have the first sort of reference to it in Genesis one twenty six, when God said, says, and God said, let us make man in our image. So it was in plural, and the word Elohim was used in the singular, El in the, in the, in the, for uh, two, it would be Eloi, and then in, with three or more, it's Elohim. That's, that's how they do the plural in, in Hebrew. And in Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. Okay, God, again, Elohim, plural. Our God is one, Echad which is a compound unity in the same way that we say we are all one in the spirit, right? It's sort of a compound unity. It's a one, it's a oneness, but there's a compoundness to it. And that's what that word means. The Lord, our God is one. He is united. Matthew 28, the great commission, he goes, tells, tells us to go out and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so it's, it's, it's in the scripture. It's referred to. You know, what, what the Trinity is not is not polytheism. It is not three different gods. It's not a multiple personality disorder where God is different people at different times. And it is not a name given to different things that God does. Well, when he does this, we call him the Father. When he does this, we call him the Son. When he does this, we call him the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. In 1 John 5, 7, you know, this is, this is a verse that, to me, even though it doesn't use the word Trinity, I don't know what else... Anybody can get from this, but there are always those. Uh, 1 John 5, in verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. You know, pretty clear. 2 Corinthians 13. Chapter 13, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. And this is where, you know, Paul just sort of weaves it into this sentence. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Right? We have in Romans 1, 7, God is our Father. In Colossians 1, 13 to 15, 
Christ is the Son, the image of the invisible God. Titus 3, 4, it's speaking of Jesus Christ. He is God, our Savior. And then in Acts 5, this is with Ananias and Sapphira, they, they accuse them of lying to the Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, you have not lied to men, you have lied to God. Equating the Holy Spirit with God. So each one is God. I'm sorry, went through those. Right? Each one is holy God, but they are individual persons. You know, the, the closest thing that we have in comparison is we look at ourselves. If you want to consider ourselves to be what trichotomous, body, soul, and spirit, right? My body is what you see, what you, everybody is looking at right now, and I'm using my body to, to communicate with you. It is the phys- physical expression of who I am. But it's not who I am. The who I am, this body is going to go on the ground and decay. The who I am is going to go live with God. And that's the part you don't see. You know, and the whole, and the, uh, my spirit is that part of me that communes with God. That is separate from my soul. You know, I mean, at the very least, we know that there is an immaterial part of us and a material part of us, and the two are one, but they're each separate, and we don't really completely understand it. Well, the, the Trinity is not that different from that. The Father is the planner, the source of, of all things. John 5, 19, the Son is the, the executor. All things are done through him. The, the only physical manifestation of God. John 1, 1 to 3. The Spirit is the means by which God communicates. John 16, 13 to 14. Again, just because of time, I'm just, I'm just referring to these. And they should be up there. Well, some of them are up there. <laughs> Um, and there is subordination, which means that they submit themselves in a certain order. The Spirit submits himself to the Son. The Son submits himself to the Father. Right? In function, not in nature. They are not inferior because they are, they are one. But in their function, they are subordinate. Now, two heresies that have sort of popped up out of this. In the third century, a man named Sibelius um, said that they're not persons, but they're manifestations. That God is, there's, there's only one God, and, and he sometimes manifests himself as the Son. Sometimes he manifests himself as the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he manifests himself as the Father. But they just appear, it's what's called modality, a modalism, in different modes. God exists in different modes. And um, we actually have it today, um, certainly in Unitarianism. Unitarianism d- denies the Trinity. Uh, we also see it in a movement called um, Oneness Pentecostalism. And it's not Pentecostalism as a whole. There's a certain branch of of Pentecostal churches called Oneness Pentecostals. And I forget some of the names of some of the, some of the folks that are in it. Um, and again, I, you know, they, I believe that they're believers and sometimes we're, we're fighting over semantics. Uh, but, they, but they don't believe in the Trinity. They believe that God has just manifested himself in different ways at different times and in different modes. Uh, and then the other heresy that came out in the 4th century was Arius. This is sort of why they, they started talking about the Trinity was because he believed that the Son and the Spirit were lesser gods. They were God-ish. But they were lesser gods. The Father willed them into existence to act as his agents. They are separate entities. And we see this in the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons today. That, that Jesus Christ is a lesser God. He is not God himself. He is a created being. 
And people use all kinds of analogies, you know, the egg, the yolk, the shell, the white. People say water, you know, ice, steam, um, um, and water, you know. Uh, There's all kinds of different analogies that are out there. Um, Using our own makeup, our own trichotomy, to me, is the the best way for us to, to even begin to wrap our brain around this thing that I gave you is another one that um, looks at uh, the Trinity almost the way we look at time. You know, time is this whole thing, yet there is the past, the present, and the future. And they are all time. You know, they're not, you can't say that, they're, well, they're just a part of time. Well, not really, because there's always the present. You know, there's the present, and then there's the present, and then there's the present, and then there's, you know, there's all, we're always in the present. There's always a past, and the past makes up all of time, right? Eventually, all of time is going to be in the past, you know? The future is really where we're heading, and it's always there. So it's not like it's just a part of time. Uh, and this this was an analogy that was written by this this gentleman, and it sort of gives us a little bit of, a, of a, um, an ability to wrap our brain around. It's a little complicated, but, you know, just something to read and, 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 and see if God sort of, you know, helps us understand it. Because we're not going to completely be able to wrap our brain around the Trinity. We don't, we don't have the capacity. Our finite mind can't do it. And if we could, then, then the wonder of God would be lost. <laughs> right? Then we would, <laughs> you know, what... What kind of God is there that it, would he be if we could, I could completely understand everything about his nature? You know, the fact that I can't comprehend him completely is more evidence that he's God and that there are things about him that, you know, that are beyond my capability to completely understand. So um, next week we will be moving on to the next chapter, uh, which is Christology the doctrine of Christ. And, uh, and then after that, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And so we'll be talking a little bit more about the Trinity in, 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 with respect to those, uh, uh, to those things. So any questions or comments? Yeah, this is next week. Give you an idea of what we're going to be covering. All right.